Is your heart really his? Then what else does he get? Everything. Is that right? Acts chapter 4, where we are this morning. While you're turning there and you find Acts 4, keep your finger there and then go to Ephesians 4. Take my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. If you get your heart, it gets everything. You understand that, right? If it's in your head alone, it doesn't do much. You have knowledge, then you can get puffed up with that knowledge. But when it goes down into your heart, it changes your life. When it's down into your heart, it's going to be displayed in the way in which you live your life. When it goes down in your heart, it's going to be displayed in the way you treat people and you're a steward of things or stuff, right? Isn't that true? Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul would write in verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in? Love. Bearing with one another in? Love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called into one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in y'all. <laughs> yeah. What Paul is emphasizing there, the truth that if any man be in Christ, there's a unity that we all have. You've heard the expression, blood is thicker than water. And what do they mean by that? Is that, that biological ties or family ties are stronger than friendships. But I want to suggest to you that the spirit is far stronger than blood. That your real family are the sons and daughters of God, the children of God. Our real family is one another. And Paul is talking about that fact that we need to maintain the unity we already have. You don't have to create unity, do we? Do we have to create oneness? No, we already have it. That oneness was really displayed at the Last Supper when Jesus celebrated with his disciples. We call it the Last Supper. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a Gentile. But as Jews, it was called the Seder or the last Passover that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. And at that last Passover, he did something extraordinary. He took the common elements of bread and wine and instituted what we call communion, recognizing the giving of himself, the sharing of his body and the shedding of his blood for your sake and for mine. That through that one loaf that he would take and he would bless, eucharisteo, giving of thanks. That's what it means when the Eucharist, eucharisteo means just simply the giving of thanks. He took that bread and he broke it and he distributed it among them all. So they all partook of that one loaf. That one loaf that was nourishing him, nourished them, nourished one another. The same cup, one cup that they drank out of, the cup of blessing, the cup of the Lord. Why? Because they would be unified. They'd become one. Jesus brought about that unity through the person of the Holy Spirit. And now it's our privilege and our joy to have a walk worthy of the calling with which we were called to walk in love, to walk in unity one with another. Okay. And in my 30 plus years of ministry, the greatest grief is to see all the divisions that occur in the body of Christ, when we should be one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one people, one new man, as Paul would write so extensively in Galatians and in, in Ephesians, that we're no longer Jew and Gentile, but now we're one new man in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? 
as we've been looking at the book of Acts and studying through it. And if you're new to our chapel family, I'm a Bible expositor. And all that simply means is I teach through the scriptures. And we started with the book of Acts just a couple of weeks ago. And we started with the first word, the first verse, first chapter. And we're going to work our way through the entire text. And then you keep it in its context. You keep an accurate interpretation and understanding of what God is trying to tell us through his word. The only way to really know God is through his word. The word of God makes clear to us who the God of the word really is. Amen? Yeah. And so when we got into chapter 2 of Acts, we saw that what was birthed in chapter 2? Messianic Judaism. All of these Jews who previously embraced pharisaical Judaism or religiosity, trying to, by their do's and their don'ts, win approval before God. Nothing could be farther from the truth, right? Now they came to recognize that the fulfillment of all that God had promised in the Old Testament was realized in the person of Jesus Christ. And in the resurrection and ascension of Jesus and in the reception of the Holy Spirit who came down upon them, gave the validation, the affirmation that all that Jesus said and did was true. He accomplished everything that he had set out to do. The one monumental event of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If the gospel is going to be preached, if the gospel is going to be shared, you must, you have to continually share the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Amen? That's our blessed hope, right? And then in chapter 3, we saw that the uh, disciples had gathered together. An extraordinary event had taken place. What was that extraordinary event? Lame man was made whole. Now, the lame man made whole, that transformation that took place, that was a validation of what to all of the others now? The power of God and the resurrection of Christ. Now, listen, the validation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the early apostles, that 120 gathered together in the upper room, is the reception of the Holy Spirit. And once the Holy Spirit has come, he's come. He's here. He will be with you forever, never to leave you nor forsake you. He will be with you unto the end of the... And may it be this week, Lord. <laughs> I pray. But in chapter 3 now, we saw a lame man who had been lame from birth. He was born that way. Wow. Yeah. Sharing yesterday. How, how, much, how much did you have to do with your first birth? Anything at all? Nothing? You sure? You didn't have to talk your parents into coming together? You know, I want to be born in this world. I, I, I really want to be here. So, you know, I, I want you to do something about getting together here and producing one of me. Did you do that? No, no. In that first nine months of your existence in the safest place for mankind, in a woman's womb, mama, mama's belly, did you do anything about that? No, no, no. no not, none of your effort whatsoever? Completely out of your control? Birth by the will of God alone? Is that true? Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to suggest to you the same thing. It's true in your second birth. What's your second birth? When you're born again, born from above. But you had nothing to do with that either, beloved. Or you don't understand grace, amazing grace, wonderful grace. Because if it's dependent upon you making the right choice, then it's you who saved yourself. Do you understand that? Do you understand the logic in that? And you can't possibly save yourself. No. The validation, the affirmation that Jesus accomplished everything that he said he would at his first coming, his resurrection, his ascension, was the reception of the Holy Spirit in their lives. He came to be with us now and forever. He'll be with us even until the end of the age. But then for everyone else who is hearing them preach the gospel, the good news, that's what gospel simply means, good news. The validation, the affirmation that Jesus rose from the dead was what? To all of those people in Jerusalem that gathered together who were at Solomon's parlor to call? The healed life, the changed man, the transformed life. Your transformed life, not your words. I don't listen to what people tell me. I watch their life. I listen with my do you? you ha listen, beloved, you have to listen with your eyes because there's so many deceivers out there, so many hypocrites, so much... Hip Is there hypocrisy in the church? Yes. Is the number one reason why people won't come to church, they say it's full of? Yes. And it's true. But you know what your response should be? We got room for one more. Come on. <laughs> Go, 
on, we're going to take one more. Yeah. Who's not a hypocrite? Anyone who doesn't believe they have any hypocrisy in their life at all, please stand up. No, oh, it's true. But the evidence to everyone who we know and love intimately, deeply, and those who we know casually as we're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ has to be our transformed lives. The changes that we make. What are we celebrating Tuesday? What are we celebrating? Independence Day, right? Independence, freedom. Are you free? You're not free. You're either a slave of sin and Satan, or you're a love slave of Jesus and God, the Holy Spirit. Romans makes that clear. Everyone, listen, everyone is a slave. There are no free men. Jesus, when he descended into Hades, he was there for three days, three nights, preaching to those who had died, believing, believing God, the faithful. And then it says that when, when he ascended, after he arose from the dead, 40 days seen on earth, but then he ascended up into heaven, and he took all those who were in paradise, Abraham's bosom with him, and they became his love captives, slaves. You understand that? Now, the only real independence you have, beloved, and I want you to listen very closely, the only real freedom that you have is your reaction to the situations and the circumstances of life. I have very little control. All I have to do is go to a Mexican restaurant, and later on that night, I discover I have very little control. You know? <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? You, well, how much control do you really have? Seriously. You know. God had to teach the boys. You know, these were expert fishermen. These men fished on the Sea of the Galilee all their life. They know that sea like the back of their hand. And now all of a sudden, there was a storm that rose up, something they had never experienced before. And now the ship started to sink. It was taking in water. And what were they doing? And what was God showing them? How much control they have. <laughs> when the ship begins to sink out there, you, you're not going to have much control over it, if at all, if any at all. But what we do have complete 100% control over and freedom to exercise is our reaction. Do you understand? Oh, boy. In my 72 years here, I'm learning more and more how I need to take control over the freedom God has given me and my reaction to situations, to people, to circumstance. And may it be godly. May it be the type of reaction that God wants out of my life. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So are there any free men and women? No, 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 no. We're all slaves. You're either slave to sin and Satan, which hopefully nobody here in my hearing is, here in the sanctuary or over the internet. Or you're a love slave to Jesus, that Jesus is your master. Everyone is mastered, Right? And so we've been talking about this now because as we get into chapter 4, chapter 3, the lame man was made whole, and Peter had the opportunity to preach once again the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 4, what began the first sign of what in the church? Chapter 4, you remember? Persecution. First, listen, the first evidence or record of persecution of the church was there in chapter 4. Who decided to persecute the church? Who? The religious leaders. Now, I want to suggest to you this, that we are living in an apostate age. If you don't know that, you don't know the Bible. <clears throat> if you don't know we're living in an apostate age and there are more apostasies out there than there are true believers, there are more apostates, more false teaching, more false teachers than there are the true. But Jesus told us that exactly what would be happening during this age of which kingdom? Mystery. The mystery kingdom. Matthew 13. The mystery kingdom was comprised of those who are true believers, make believers. True doctrine, false doctrine. A true growth of the body, which is very natural, and this monstrosity that was so unnatural. You understand? And so Jesus gave us that understanding that that's the age we're in now. 
So as we understand that, we want to make certain that we are following and obeying and living to the truth. Amen? In chapter 4, the first persecution of the church is recorded there. Who was persecuting the church? The religious leadership, okay, they were. And the people are going to persecute you. If you're really following Jesus with all your heart, here's my heart, Lord. Is it really? If he gets your heart, he gets everything. Everything, you see. The world and even the professing church is so longing to see people whose hearts are truly given over to Jesus. Truly. You see, Jesus brought that to a new level, and I want you to have this understanding. If you love husband or wife, mother or father, son or daughter, more than you love me, Jesus said. You what? Now, is that not heavy duty? But there are such lesser things that those who profess faith love more than Jesus. Lesser things than mother or father, son or daughter, husband or wife, but... How many of those lesser things are they enjoying today rather than celebrating the Lord's Day? You know. Mm. That's a measure of where your heart really lies. First persecution of the church by the religionists and the persecution we will suffer if we're really going to follow Jesus is going to be by the apostates and religionists of our day. Oh, you're so divisive. Oh, you're so judgmental. Oh, you're so pharisaical. Hmm. What group of people in our community would represent Pharisaism in the minds of liberals more than anybody else in our community? Who? Who? What group within evangelicalism would represent Pharisaism or legalism or be a judgmental attitude in our community, right here in Greenville, more than any other? Who? Who? Good morning. How are you? Good. What you doing here? Where's the rest of the family? Home. They just shipped you here? What are you doing here? Please. Why are you here? Where? For soccer. So soccer, soccer. Where, where, where are you practicing soccer? Where are you? BJU. B who? BJU. What does that mean? Bob Jones. Bo Bob Jones University. That's a wonderful university, isn't it? Um, it truly is. Now, what's the reputation of BJU in our community? Among liberal evangelicals, among most Holistic. contemporary evangelicals. What's it? Very legalist. Now, now, they did have a reputation for being a little too strict. Well, so did I as a father. <laughs> Why? Trying to self-safeguard my children. Okay, and then, and then you, can, you can't fault them for that, but they got a little bit too overboard on the legalism, didn't they? But they've changed dramatically. Did you know that? But I heard someone make the comment to me the other day, oh, we don't want to be like Bob Jones. We don't want to be like those Bob Jones people. And I said, my friend, as time moves forward, I'm going to have far more in common with those people than I ever will with the rest of evangelicalism in Greenville County. Is that not true? And if you disagree with me, we can have lunch out in the back and we can discuss it. I'd be more than happy to do that. It's an open invitation. But you see, you're going to be persecuted more. If you're really going to live for Jesus all your heart, you're going to be looked down upon as judgmental, as legalistic, as pharisaical, just like the BJ University is today, and it shouldn't be. You know, it's one of the very, very, very few institutions that still embrace literally the first 11 chapters of Genesis. And what do I mean by that? Creationism. And all of that, listen, the foundational doctrines of Christianity are found in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, and you would be hard-pressed to find a handful of university, Christian universities today that literally embrace the first, five, first 11 chapters of Genesis. So, you've got to make a decision. Which side of this battle are you going to be on? Now, who really brought about that persecution through the religionists? We call him Hasatan. What's his name? Satan, Satan Lucifer, right? So he, he thought he could defeat this, this new expression of God's love, 
and unity in the world through persecution. Did it work? No. No. What happens when he persecutes the church? It gets stronger. Hey, hey, as difficult times arise, what, what, what happens with people? They actually come closer together. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I'm going to see my son tomorrow. You know, we're going to take a ride up there. We're going to go through the woods. I mean, you know, we're just going to have a good time. There's several things we've got planned to do. Uh, but I'll, I'll call you when I come on my way back. Oh, wait a minute. There's going to be trouble in Simpsonville tomorrow. There's going to be a storm arising. And so I better stay home. I better take care of you. You and I better stay together. Remember when that hurricane came through? Just not even a quarter of a mile from our house. And what did we do? Remember what we did? We went downstairs in that one area where there's there's three walls, three fun, and and, and we closed all the doors, and and we cuddled. (laughs) You and me and Snickers. And we cuddled, and we waited for that storm to go by, didn't we? Oh, boy. and 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 we drew close, didn't we? Yeah. Let's go do that now. Come on. (laughs) You understand what I'm saying? When difficult times do arise, that's that's when we, as a family, should draw closer together than we've ever been. Husbands and wives, parents and their children, and God's children. So when persecution arises, the church is more unified. The church becomes more together, more one. Persecution never destroys the church. It strengthens the church, right? It's the good times that weaken the church. Unfortunately, you've heard that expression. Good times produce weak men. That's where we are today. Good times produce weak men. Weak men produce hard times. Hard times produce strong men produce good times. And here we go again. Okay? It's a cycle that happens. Now, my prayer is that as we experience some difficult times in the future, that more good men and women will rise up, be united, and stand for Christ. Because we're in a terrible shape now, aren't we? But after that persecution that arose in the beginning of chapter 4, towards the end of chapter 4, what do we see had taken place? The love that they had one for another. You know, there's some wonderful, exciting things that happened, right? What was happening? But think back now to the few weeks we were in the book of Acts. How many believers are there now? Thousands. We have no idea. And and when Peter stood up and preached that first sermon in chapter 3, how many got saved? 3,000. 3,000. And and then after the lame man had been made whole and they arrested Peter and John, but many came to faith and were baptized. How many then? 5,000 men alone. Men alone. So we're talking about at least 8,000 believers. Now, now if it's men alone, how about the, listen, listen, if a church targets child evangelism, if a church targets the children in the community, we need to have a bus ministry, John Michael. We need to go find a bus. We want to bus the kids in because if you get the bus, you're going to get mama and papa. Is that true? No. Nay, never. Statistics bear out that if you target the children in the community, the likelihood that mom and dad are going to come to church, it, it's a single digit percentage. Okay, I know what we do. We need to enlarge and expand our women's ministry. We need to celebrate women, right? And we we need to target the women of the community. And certainly, the women of the community bring their husbands and their children. Is that true? Now, it raises to maybe 10 or 11% chance that the rest of the family will come to church if you target the women of the house. Do you know what happens if you target the man? If men will become men and you target the men of the community and try to draw them into a life with Christ, overwhelmingly, the likelihood is that the rest of the family is going to come to church. Ah, Eight. Who said that? Praise God. Yeah, praise God. 5,000 men alone. Wow. Now, if they all brought their wives and their kids, we're talking about at least, at least a mega church, a 20,000 member church, right? And, and it, wasn't, it, was, it wasn't the church, it was Messianic Judaism. Because they were all Jews, embracing Jesus as the Messiah, the Shek Nagi, Messiah the King. But they came together, 20,000 or plus strong. And it was a pure church. They were all true believers. 
They were giving their heart to God. They loved one another. They sang with one another. They cried with one another. They were a family. It wasn't an audience. They didn't come in and listen to a talking head and then go out. They weren't looking for a concert and cotton candy, which is what most give today. Isn't that true? The big concert down at the, whatever that center is downtown. No, I'll resist. <sighs> it's just a display, the fact that we are in the age of christen. Christen? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. So many wonderful things were happening. And they so fell in love with the Lord. And Paul would always write in his epistles, I know of your faith in God and your love one for... That's, that's what faith in God always produces. If you truly have faith in God, it will produce love one for another. And Paul would write that in his epistles all the time. And it was just but one church in Jerusalem now, one assembly of... Messianic Jews who believed in Jesus as the Messiah. And, and therefore, as they gathered together for the, the feast, what feast was it they were gathered together for? Pentecost. Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks or Feast of Revelation, right? Now, many of them who came to faith and possessed now this filling of the Holy Spirit in their life, they didn't want to go anywhere. They wanted to stay in Jerusalem. Wow, so you got all these Jews who've left their homes, left their jobs, come to Jerusalem. Now, now they, they don't want to go anywhere because we've discussed, Jesus is, you know, I can remember when you first came to the chapel, Frankie. We were in that auto parts store, you know. We, we've never had uh, a grand vision of, of anything other than what God has for us. I, I have made a commitment to God that I will worry about the depth we all go in Christ and that God worry about the breadth but unfortunately, most churches are more concerned about the breath than they are the... Yeah. And therefore, it's nickels and noses that motivate them rather than to really truly disciple people so that they grow strong in the word of God and they are protected. You know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus said that, right? Whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. My truth shall set you free. My word is truth. But so few who really know, who claim to know his name really know his truth. Know the word of God. It's amazing to me. The lack of biblical knowledge and understanding here in the buckle of the Bible Belt. But anyway, Frankie, you came to church. I remember you came to church that one Sunday. And, you know, we, we were like, no, we were more much of nothing. You know, the, the, the mayor of Simpsonville, Malden, Greenville, do they know we're here? No, 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 no. I don't think any of the council members remember. No, we're here. Who knows that we're here other than Jesus, right? But we were a smaller group then. I think maybe the front row. That was about it. Hmm? And after the service, Frankie came up, and she's just crying her eyes out. And she's like, I can't believe I've been in all the beautiful churches in Greenland. I can't believe I found God in this dump. <laughs> That's what she said. It was, it was an auto parts store. It was, a, it was a dump. But that's where Jesus likes to hang around, where the down and outers are, Right? The downcast, the rejected. Yeah. It's true, isn't it? That's who we are. Hmm? Hmm. And so they didn't want to leave. Now they have no work, and they can't get any work. Why can't they get any work? Nobody will hire them. Economic persecution. You won't bake the cake for those... It's nuts. It's absolutely nuts what's being forced upon us as a society today. It's demonic. But the economic persecution existed then, just, just like it is today. Cancer culture, they call it. And so they couldn't get jobs. They, and if they, if they were tradesmen, they, they, no one would buy their wares or their services. And, and so now they're, they're impoverished financially, but they... Don't care. I found Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now listen, that's what happens when you find Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. The things of this world grow strangely. Yeah. yeah, you could care less. And I hope that's where you are. Or are you still clinging to that stuff? Hmm? Now, 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 this early church, they were so in love with Jesus, so experiencing the Lord, they were willing to let go of everything because they really believed they owned nothing. nothing.
Nothing. The only thing you own, the only thing you have freedom over is your reaction, your conduct, your character. That's it, right? And, and so go to the text now. We're going to chapter 4, pick it up in verse 32. It tells us previously in 31 that when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. What were they praying for just previously? Boldness. And what does God give them? Boldness, instantly. Don't you love it when God answers your prayer so quickly? Wow. Then in verse 32, it says, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. The unity that existed there. One heart, one soul, one mind, one purpose, one will. Wow. Now, the church has never been more one than it was then. You understand? There's only been divisions since then. It grieves all of us that there's such division in the church today, right? But at this time, there's only one messianic movement here. It was in Jerusalem. It didn't exist anywhere else, and so there's no place else to go. But they had of one heart, one mind, one purpose, one will. Neither did anyone say that any things that he possessed was, but they had all things in I don't own nothing. You own anything? Now, let me tell you a secret. And listen closely, especially you men. Everything you have, very soon, either you're leaving it or it's leaving you. How much did Herod keep of his wealth? Pharaoh, Stalin, all the other monsters of the world, right? Trying to accumulate power and wealth. How much were they able to keep? and maintain, hang on to. No, now the early church recognized, you know, nothing is our own, but it's all been given to us. Do you understand your stewardship before? 100% of everything you have was given to you by whom? Wow. Now, most of you don't believe that, do you? Now, how do I know that? Because you still hang on to it. Mine. You remember, what's it, a golem? Precious. Mine. A little creepy monster, huh? <laughs> but I don't live like that, do I? No, 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 no. no, no. But it was that greed that turned him into gold. Yeah. That's right. Love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now, why do I say that? Because you're hanging on to it. Well, you hang on to it. Oh, but you're hanging on to mine. Mine. Now, listen. Who is not a hypocrite? We're all hip hypocrites. To some degree, lesser or greater, to some degree, you're a hypocrite. Now, now, the point is, as we move forward in our relationship with the Lord, we want that hypocrisy to be less and less and less in our life. And we want our hearts to truly display that it's been given over to God more and more and more. This early church, so possessed and so filled of the Holy Spirit, we own nothing. And now it's our responsibility because we've all come to know Jesus Christ. We're all one big family. If there's anyone in need, we need to meet that need. Wow. That's love, isn't it? That's what it says here. Any, they, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had great th all things in common. And with great power, megas dunamis, right? They prayed for boldness and power, and they're going to get it with great power. The apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, they're talking about what's most important. Are you in Jesus? Doesn't matter how much you have, does it? I want just enough to be satisfied, but, but, but not so little that I'm, I'm, I'm begrudging or angry at God. But um, we need to be very careful in keeping that balance, don't we? Godliness with? That's abundant life. Jesus said, I come to give you life, and I'm going to give it to you more abundantly. You know what it is? Godliness and contentment. Why? Because then you don't get greedy, you don't get jealous, you don't get envy. None of those manifestations of the flesh will come about in your life. Always trying to keep up with the who? Who are those people anyway? The Joneses. I don't know. You know. I don't want to keep up with the Joneses. I want to keep up with the Jesus people. Right? Yeah. So they preached with great power, mega dudamus, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord. And great grace 
was upon them all. Now, how was this great grace displayed? In such giving attitudes. They were sharing saints, man. They shared everything as saints. Are you a foodie? Yeah, are you a foodie? So that, you know, I, I can remember, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be less and less of a foodie. But I'm such a foodie that if I'm enjoying something and you want some of it, I'll order you what I've got, but you're not getting any of mine. <laughs> I do now. Yeah, I, I do that now, and now I share whatever. I mean, you know, but, but before, I, you know, if I, if I had a dish and I enjoyed this dish, you better keep your fork out of it. You know? I'll, I'll buy you, but don't touch my plate. Right? Is that not true? You know? I used to drive my son crazy that way. You know, he, he was that way too. You know, I, no. When the Lord really touches your heart, you know that nothing possesses your own and you want to give to everybody who is in need and you want to be a sharing, gracious, loving Christian. They, listen to me, here's what they did. They were so filled with the Holy Spirit that anybody who had possessions of houses or lands went and sold everything they had and laid it at the apostles' feet to distribute as there was a need. Holy Spirit. Wow. Can you imagine that today? How many of you are willing to sell your house? And bring the money here so that the, the board and the, and the deacons and the deacons control the finance, financial house of the church, that they can distribute the wealth of the church as there is a need. How many of you are willing to do this? Sell your lands and your house. Okay, all right, let's not go radical. How about your car? All right, all right, let's not get that radical. How about your boat or your motorcycle? <laughs> Pastor, you're really meddling now. Yeah, how about your how about the how about the, the, the old tires from your bicycle? <laughs> mo, mo, listen, listen, that's why I'm telling you when you say you, you my whole heart is Jesus's, right? If your heart's Jesus, he has everything. But the indication that he doesn't have everything is the way you're holding on to your stuff. Precious. What percentage of the church tithes today? Two. What do I mean by that, 2%? What, what, what do the 2% give? What's the tithe? Now, now, pastor, is that my gross or my net? Well, how do you want God to bless you, on your gross or your net? <laughs> it's a pretty simple question, right? Now, it says that when you give to God, you give to him first, right? He, the first fruits belong to God before Uncle Sam gets anything? I hate this uncle. You know, he, he's a partner of mine. He gives me nothing. He takes everything, right? And so people will ask me. You know, I, I was at a pastor's conference. I don't know how many hundreds of pastors there. They had a Q&A. One of the pastors, I don't know who it was. Thank goodness it was on a card and he didn't raise his hand. said, should we tithe? We're pastors and we get a salary from the church. Should we tithe? What's the answer to that? Yes. Of course they should. They should tithe more above and beyond. Oh my what a crazy question that was. Should we tithe? Right? Now, they, listen, this group of crazies, these are Jesus freaks. They didn't give 10%. What did they give? 100%. Ever hear of an industrialist named Laterno? Turn of the century? Laterno? You know, you know he, he was an extremely rich man. He lived, he purposed to live on 10% of his wealth. He gave away 90. Great grace. Great power. Right? Now, now that's how you can tell when the grace of God is really apprehended. So now that I'm not trying to convict you. I'm trying to touch your heart. If there needs to be an adjustment made, I would encourage you to make that adjustment before it's too late. Because what we're going to see as we move into chapter 5 is that judgment begins where? God will not be mocked. Your hypocrisy, your sin, your stinginess, your greed, it will show itself. God rewards a cheerful giver. Now, now here, I want to make it very clear. Um, John Michael, did you bring the chicken buckets this morning? The chicken buckets. You didn't bring any chicken? No, 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 no. I'm sorry? Extra chicken buckets. Oh, we don't take an offering here. 
In all of the years we've been meeting, we have never taken an offering except when we're asking to help somebody out there. But we've never taken an offering for ourselves, ever. So please relax. I'm not shaking you down. <laughs> My father takes good care of me. He takes good care of all of us. But the problem is with you. God doesn't need it. We don't need it. But you need to let go of it. Because what did you say? What made Golem? It's greed. They greed that what I'm going to hold on. No one will know. Who knows? The first of the month when I write out all my bills, you know. Did you ever get that little conviction that you're not really giving to God? Hmm. If, if the church in the United States just tithe, not, not 100% like these folks, if the church in the United States just gave 10%, There'd be no need. Do you understand that? We, we would have such a... Look at the abundance now. Obscenely blessed we are. But unfortunately, most spend it on themselves. I think it was the year before last, 45% of our budget went to missions. Out. 45%. It's unheard of. Right? We don't want to keep it for ourselves. We want to give it to the Lord for his work. Enough to make sure we have something for a rainy day or unforeseen circumstance shows up. But, but you are a very giving congregation in that way because it's the leadership of the church's responsibility to tie the tithe. Isn't that right, David? If you're a deacon, any of the deacons are here, they'll tell you. Every year we make sure we go above and beyond the tithe of the tithe. What's the tithe of the tithe? Well, we receive a tithe from you, and, but we make sure that we have to tithe from that tithe. And we want to make sure it's at least in excess of 15%. It goes out, at least. It's our responsibility before God. It's our stewardship. Wow. And great grace fell upon them all, nor was anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands, all, all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet to distribute to each as anyone had need. And it's amazing. Think about it, would you? All of them. Now, there were all these people from all other areas of the known world who were coming into Jerusalem, and they came to realize that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. They, they came into this oneness that Christ wants to bring in his body. That was the body of Christ, okay? It's always been the body of Christ, whether it's Jew or Gentile, whether it's both of us together now. It's just the body of Christ. They came together, and they didn't want to leave one another. This is wonderful what's happening here, and I've never felt so good in my life. I've never felt so much love. I've never felt so much ex excitement and acceptance and grace. Grace, marvelous grace. I don't want to leave here. I would drive 250 miles to go to church on a Sunday when I first got saved. I would drive from, from Saratoga, New York, which is just at the foothills of the Adirondack Mountains, all the way to the Finger Lakes of New York, to Lake Canandaigua, because there was a Calvary Chapel that started there by one of the disciples of Chuck Smith. And I was introduced to that ministry through a research scientist at GE. And the first time I experienced the grace of God was in that movement and among that community. And my wife thought I was out of my mind. You've lost it. I, I, you were pretty predictable as an unsaved man, but now I have no idea what's going on in you. <laughs> and she'd get out a map of New York, and she'd say, we live here, and you're going here, and you're telling me you can't find a church to go to from here to here? And all I could tell her was this. I, I, I can't explain what I experience. But I am experiencing God in a way that I could have never imagined, nor thought, nor dreamed. And I can't get enough. It ever happened to you? You know what I'm talking Who knows what I'm talking about? Oh, man. Now, that's what happened to this crowd. We're not leaving. Lord, it is good for us to be here. Let us build three tabernacles, right? <laughs> and, and we'd stay on, this, on this, this Christian campground. It was called Laterno. After the industrialists, because he built, uh, he supported missions and Christian camps all over the country, all over the world. And so there was one there, Lake Canandaigua. And so when we would go, I would bring my tent and we'd tent there. It's 
wonderful. So I, I can relate somewhat, somewhat. And it was so joyous. And they didn't want to leave. And those who were there who had anything said, look, you know, we, we, you know listen, we need, to, we need to help these people. And even as a matter of fact, after this event occurred, when the Apostle Paul was going throughout the known world at that time and establishing churches, they would realize the persecution that came upon the body of Christ there in Jerusalem and, and, and even in Macedonia. What did they do? They gave generously for the suffering church in Jerusalem. Wow. Wow. That layman was made whole. Where was he begging? At the gate called Beautiful, right? Before they were going in the church. He said, you just, you know, just, just, come on, you know what God tells you to do. Take care of the poor and the widow and orphans and... Now, the beggar was outside the church then. The beggars are where now? Inside the church at the pulpit. <laughs> oh, that's so true. Now we have an example that, that uh, Luke wants to record for us of one man's generosity. In verse 36, it says, And Joseph, whose name is Joseph, if you have a King James translation, who was also named Barnabas, by the apostles, which is translated the son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Wow. Wait a minute. We got some problems here, right? Well, wait a minute. Why would do I? Barnabas was his nick. Nickname. Thank you. Somebody called on. Listen to me now. His name was Joseph. It can also be interpreted Joseph. But his nickname was Barnabas. Why was his nickname Barnabas? He was such an encourager. He was such a generous man. He was such a giving man. I, I, I think of this big, robust kind of a guy, you know, just willing to buy ice cream for everybody. <laughs> yeah. And the sharing was incredible. But there's a problem here. He was a Levite. What's the problem? Levites weren't supposed to own land. Hmm. So how do we explain that? Well, they weren't supposed to own land where? In Israel. And he was from where? Cyprus. Okay, so there we go. Problem solved, all right? He could buy a technicality. He might have hired a Philadelphia lawyer. I don't know, you know. But, but he could own land in Cyprus. He was from the land in Cyprus. But he sold everything, and he brought it, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. There's so many admonitions in the Bible of how we're supposed to be generous and giving. Go with me to 1 John, the first Johannine epistle. 1 John, not the gospel, but the epistle. And I want to be honest with you. In the beginning, I was not a generous man. I worked hard for my money. And that's the way I thought of it. My money. It's not my money. Who's given you, you the ability to create wealth? Who's given you your intellect, your, your talents, your abilities? Who's put the very breath in your lungs? Everything, everything you have, you owe to God. Everything, right? But I'll be very honest with you. I wasn't a generous person in the beginning. God's made me a generous person. And I'm thankful for that. I realize that what I have doesn't really belong to me. I'm a steward of it. And the most valuable possession I've ever had that I'm a steward of, I talked about last week. What's that? Children. Children. They don't belong to us. You, you may have brought them into this world biologically, but they don't belong to you. They belong to God. And you have a stewardship for them as well, don't you? Where did I say to go? First John. Okay, go to chapter 3. He who knows not love knows not God because God is, right? That's what John would tell us. John's the apostle of? Peter's the apostle of? Peter's, Peter's the apostle of hope, and Paul is the apostle of? Faith. Faith, hope, and love, these three. And they got you know, representative of each as the apostles. But here in chapter 3, verse 16, John, the apostle of love, would write, By this we know love. 
Because he laid down his life for us, we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Wow, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in... So important, isn't it? It really is. Now, when there's a genuine need, right? You know, I mean, these panhandlers that you see on the corner, it's unbelievable how later on you'll see them and they get into their brand new car. Or they pull out a wad of cash. You know. So you got to be careful. Now, there's enough ministries in town if you would like to support those ministries that help the homeless. But you need to be very careful. I passed, uh, my wife and I were going downtown just the other day, and there's this beat up kind of an SUV in front of me, and it had two signs on the back window of the SUV, and it's got one of those, those uh, what do you call it? Yeah, that kind of thing. QR code. I'm a dinosaur. It's got that QR code, and the one on the left side said, uh, hit, hit the QR code. We are a young couple who are homeless, and we have great needs, so you can contribute to our GoFundMe page. Teen couple. Teen couple. Young teen couple. Homeless. Then the other QR code had a sign, and it said, oh, and by the way, you can click on this QR code for Amazon and find out what we would like. Wish list, our wish list. And Gail drove by them and she said, go get a job. No, she didn't. No, didn't. <laughs> but but well, look, look, at, look at all of the help wanted signs that are all over the community, all over the country. Nobody wants to work, but everybody wants a handout. Everybody thinks they're entitled. I would never, would you ever, ever, ever think of doing anything like that? My, my father was not a Christian, but my father was a, one of the hardest working men I've ever known, and he never took anything from anybody. He was never on any kind of government assistance. In he would never do that. Would be he would be ashamed of himself if he had the ability to work. And I have to tell you something. One thing I am thankful. My father was not a Christian. He didn't lead me to Christ, and I'm sorry about that. I, I wish he had done more in my life to father me spiritually. But one thing my father gave me was a work ethic. My father had no lazy children. I was telling the men yesterday, I have had a job since I was 12 years old. That's 60 years I've been working. 60, I have never, ever, ever been without a job. 60 years I've been working. When I first got married, because of the difficulties that I brought upon myself because of my bad choices, I had to work two full-time jobs. I operated a machine on third shift for G, and I drove a delivery truck all day long. And then I worked weekends doing side jobs because it was a man's responsibility to take care of his own. And if you don't provide for your own, you're what? Worse than a heathen, worse than an infidel. But today, my goodness, everybody has an excuse why they can't work. You know. Taking care of your own truly displays the love of God. Go with me to Mark chapter 10. You drinking over there? <laughs> now again, please, please. I know what selfishness is. I was one, and to some degree I'm still a selfish guy. I wouldn't share those cheesecakes with her for nothing. But if, if this is touching home, if this is touching home, then you need to repent. You need to ask God to, to forgive you and to help you become a Barnabas, a man of great grace, who gave generously, hilariously. It's, 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 to, it's to your shame that I would have to tell you that if the church, if the little, our little chapel was dependent upon 80% of you to exist financially, we wouldn't exist. We'd have to shut the doors. Now, how do you know that, Pastor? You're not supposed to know what anybody gives. Well, that's true. I don't know specifically. But what I do know is this. My administrator, at the end of every year, she tells me how many giving units we have, how many giving families, and, and then what the giving is, 
because we invite people to an annual meeting based upon a minimal amount. We're going to raise that this year. But, but I'm always shocked at the percentage of people that aren't going to get invited to an annual meeting. I can remember a time when I had a leader, one of my elders. I'm looking over the invite for the annual meeting in February, and he's not on the list. And I said to the administrator, I said, you, you, you forgot. No, I didn't. What do you mean, no, you didn't? Well, there's a certain criteria that I had to meet. It was minimal. It was nothing. It was like five bucks a week to get an invite. I said, you, what? Are you serious? Oh, boy. I brought him in the office. I said, you, you can't, I can't tell you how bad I feel for you. That, that your conscience would allow you to do that. The very church that has done exceedingly and abundantly for you and your family. That's amazing to me that your conscience would allow you to do that. Maybe you should go somewhere else. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for the same reason why I sat down with that fellow. Because it's, it's to your benefit that you allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart and your life to take that grip off of that stuff. It's not worth it. What does it gain a man if he should inherit the wealth of the world and lose his soul? What's he gained? Nothing. But people will forsake their soul, put their soul in jeopardy for far less than the wealth of the world. Hmm? Uh, chapter 10, Jesus comes across this rich young ruler. You know the story. Verse 17, chapter 10 of Mark's gospel. Now as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. The rest of us are hypocrites, right? What, what is a hypocrite? Yeah, let me make it real simple to you. In chapter 5, we're going to talk about a couple who are just the opposite, the polar opposite of Barnabas. Who are they? Ananias and Sapphira. What did they do? Lied. They lied to who? God. Of all things, they lied to God. Now, we're probably going to get into that next week. We're going to get into that this week. But, but next week, they lied to God. What is a hypocrite? A person who's living the lie, living a lie. That's a hypocrite. Before I was saved, I lived a lot of lies. Lying was quite acceptable to gain advantage or whatever it is. You know, the, the, the means justifies the... So, you know, it was, I, could, I could justify it. But then I came to the truth. Truth meant nothing before that. But then I came to experience the truth. And that all has to change. And for the last, whew, whatever it's been, what has it been now? 43 years I've been changing, 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 changing. Thank God. There's no one good but one, speaking of God, right? Why do you call me good? No one good but God. That is God. Now you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. It wasn't his problem, right? Every, listen, every one of you have a little darling sin. The darling, right? Now you've got to recognize what that darling sin is. You've got to recognize your area of weakness so that the enemy can't take advantage of you. You can throw a plate of sushi out there on the table this afternoon, and it won't tempt me at all. I could care less. Amen. You know? You, you put a big prime rib out there, a juicy steak with sautéed mushrooms and onions, and I'm going to have to go home because I won't be able to resist. Right? You know what I'm saying, right? So every, everybody has their, their preference. And so Jesus just didn't touch on his yet. Yet, Right? All these things I have done from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, verse 21. Now, everybody, look at verse 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, what did he say? Loving him, loved him. 
and said to him. Now, the reason, listen, the reason why I'm talking to you about this, the reason why this message is what it is, I rarely talk about money. I rarely talk about giving. If you've been here any length of time of all, you know that. I'm doing this because I love you. Listen, it doesn't affect my relationship with the Lord at all. It doesn't affect my standing with God. It doesn't affect my rewards. It doesn't affect how he'll preserve and take care of me and mine, but it affects you. Don't live a hypocritical life. Don't say you love the Lord and you, you, can't, you, can't, you, you can't even give 10%. Wow. Wow. When these people gave 100%, and we have multiple people throughout the church history who have given well over abundantly, exceedingly. Wow. Do you know some of the major supporters of this church don't even come to church here? I thank God for them. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack, go your way, sell whatever you have and give it to the poor. Do you hear about Barnabas? <laughs> no, Barnabas hadn't come yet at this point. Whatever you have, give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and take up your cross and follow me. Hmm. Go with me to Luke's gospel. Chapter 12. Serious matter. We've touched it in John. We touched it lightly here with the rich young ruler, and he went away sorrowful. Why? Because he had many possessions, many goods. So he went away very sorrowful. Why? Because he loved his stuff more than he loved Jesus. Jesus simply said, if you love mother, father, son, and daughter, husband, and wife, more than you love me, you know, with you. how about if you love stuff? I mean, he probably thinks that's absolutely crazy. How could you love stuff more than you love me? Peter denied him three times, didn't he? I can't imagine how, what an excruciating experience that had to be for Peter after the fact when he knew he denied his Lord, the one who loved him more than anybody would ever love him in life. He denied him three times when he made those those boastful claims, right? Hallelujah. Never, Lord. These, they, I know these guys. These guys, will, I will never. Really, Peter? Before the cock crows twice, you will deny you even know me three times. And so he did. Mm. But I always cry when I read through John 21 mm. and Peter's restoration back into the ministry. Have you ever made any of those brand grandiose claims and then failed? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you feel like whale dung, don't you? The bottom of the ocean. And so they're fishing all night, caught nothing. The old life has nothing for us, nothing productive, right? Fished all night, caught nothing. Jesus is up on the shore. The boys, are, they don't know it's Jesus. Hey, fellas, catch any fish? Elliot. Pastor David said he's going to take a striper fishing. You're going to catch a big one. <laughs> David's a good fisher. Catch any fish? Ah, don't want to talk about it. Fished all night, caught nothing. You're fishing on the wrong side. Fish on the right side. And you know what happened. John says to Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter puts on his clothes and gets in the water. Wow. Modest man. Gets ashore, there's coals, warm fire, fish cooking, breakfast by the sea. Remember that breakfast by the sea? Yeah, yeah. It was good in Honduras. Breakfast by the sea with Jesus, and Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, do you love me more than these? What were the these? We don't know. Peter knew. And Jesus knew. But Jesus said, Peter, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, what was cooking? The fish. Do you love me more than your fishing trade? Do you love you know, this occupation of yours? I mean, you know, you got discouraged, you got disappointed, you got distressed, and, 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 and what did you do in your depression? You go fishing. You went back to your old life. There's nothing there. Do you, do you love me more than these fish, than your fishing trade, than your fishing business? Do you? Do you? I, I could have been. Do you love me more than these who were sitting around? 
Yeah, that's what he, oh, all these, these guys may betray you, Lord, but me? Hmm. Hmm. You see, Jesus knows that if in our heart we love something more than him, whatever those these are, that's a problem for you. You answer the, you fill in the gap. Do you love me more than, what is it? What is it? As a result of what's going to happen in chapter 5, great fear comes upon the church. Everyone. Believers, unbelievers, great fear. There is no fear of the Lord today. There was a great fear in any level of hypocrisy whatsoever in that early church. Why? Because it was judged. We'll talk about that next week. Well, look here. Speaking of how we manage the things that God has given us, where did I say to go? Luke, chapter 12. Luke 12, 13. You there? Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? You know, it was just greed. It's it's such a shame. It's such a shame when we have the matriarch or the patriarch of the family die and everybody has to go get a lawyer. What in the sheol is wrong with you? Greed. You know. If that, if that occurs in your family, and you're, just walk away. Show them that your heart is not in the stuff, and it doesn't matter. It's terrible. And the only thing we leave our children is a need to go get some lawyers when we die. Whew. Horrible. Then he spoke a parable to them, verse 16. The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? And so he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will store my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for you for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Wow. Hey, I don't have to worry. My kids don't have to worry. My kids, 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 kids don't have to worry. I am rich. And what good is it all if that's where your heart lies? In verse 34 of this same same chapter, what's he going to say? No, 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 not yet. Verse 34. What's 34 say? For where your treasure is, there your... Where's your treasure, folks? That's where your heart is. Now, I'm your spiritual papa, right, as your pastor? And I love you. It's my family. And so I I have to give you this very difficult message this morning to try to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and your mind and make the adjustment in your life so that moving forward, you're going to receive such a blessing from the Lord that you don't have to be concerned about a thing. That when those pressures come, you know what? We're going to be more united with Christ, more united one with another than ever before. We're going to experience a oneness that the world can't even understand, comprehend. Do you understand that? Yeah. Jesus, in reciting this parable, he says, but God, verse 20. Now, most of the but gods we like, right? Yeah? When I was raising my son, I didn't like his buts. You know, but, 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 but. No but, Right? This is not a good but here. But God. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And then whose will those things be which you have provided? So he who lays up treasure for himself is not rich towards God. Wow. Now, most of you probably know what an interlinear is. An interlinear is the literal 
translation from the Greek text here. If you've got an Old Testament interlinear, it gives you the exact little translation from Hebrew or Aramaic, because some of the Old Testament is in Aramaic. If you have a New Testament interlinear, it gives you the exact English translation of the text from Greek to English. In the interlinear, what Jesus actually says, truly says to this man, he said, you fool, this night because he's going to die that night. This night, they demand your soul. Now, check me out. Get in there later. Check me out. That's exactly what it says in chapter 12. This night, Jesus' words, they demand your soul. Anybody free? Nobody's free. You're a slave. You're either a slave to Satan and sin, or you're a slave to God. But everybody, listen, your soul is owned. Do you understand that? So Jesus is saying to this man, you fool, what kind of a nut are you that you would exchange your soul for stuff? This night, they demand your soul. The question has to be asked, beloved, who are the they? The demons. Satan knows. Everyone's soul is possessed, owned, occupied, either by God or by Satan. Everyone, every human being you'll ever meet, their soul has been purchased. Purchased by Satan through sin and selfishness and self-centeredness, or purchased by God through grace and salvation. It's a very serious matter, isn't it? Back to the text, and we'll finish. We'll close. And we'll continue next week. It's a good introduction, anyway, to where we want to go next. Chapter 5. Next week. Verse 32, chapter 4, Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart, one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all, nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things which were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and distributed them to each as anyone had need. Now Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated the son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it. And he brought the money, and he laid it before the apostles' feet. Shall we stand? Pastor David, you come forward, and let's pray. I'm going to pray before we sing the last song. Make me a servant, humble and meek. Lord, let me lift up those who are weak. And may the prayer of my heart always be. What is it? Make me a servant. Make me a servant. Make me a servant today. Oh, Lord. Make us male and female Barnabas, Lord, mm -hmm. servants of you, good stewards of all that you have given us, Lord. <laughs> and Lord, whatever, 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 whatever you may speak to our heart, Lord, let us obey you immediately in whatever it might be. We know this wasn't uh, forced upon these people. It wasn't communism. It wasn't socialism. It was all voluntary. We'll see that next week. They just did that from the goodness of their own heart as great grace fell upon all. Jesus, may great grace fell, fall upon all of us here this morning in this sanctuary, over the internet. Lord Jesus, may your church just display these radical, reckless acts of love and kindness everywhere. And start with us, Lord. Start with us here this morning. 
in Jesus' holy name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Pastor David.